This is for Gumbo Alpine and Bazooka! This is for Falcon! This is for me! This is for Duke! And this is for the U.S. of A! Welcome to Nerdversity 101. Class begins in 3, 2, 1. Hello! Welcome to a very, very, very special episode of Nerdversity 101. I'm your host, Solo Jones, and with me is... Alex. Sam, or Rev. And... Steve. This is the podcast we've been waiting for since we announced it. We are very, very proud to announce uh, none other than Mr. Buzz Dixon. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I could live up to that. <laughs> uh, for those that might know the name, but it doesn't sound familiar, uh, why don't you uh, explain a little bit about your very career, Mr. Dixon? Well, um, to, to make it very brief, in relation to this, I was one of the story editors and original writers on the G.I. Joe, Transformers, uh, Gem in Humanoids, and My Little Pony series way back in the day. We also did Visionaries, almost left that one out. Before that, I had worked on such shows as uh, Thundar the Barbarian for uh, Ruby Spears Productions. After Transformers and G.I. Joe, I worked on uh, uh, Batman the Animated Series, Tiny Toons, a wide variety of other animated programs. And eventually, I got into uh, publishing graphic novels. I was a book packager for... Almost a decade, came out with 20 graphic novels for the tween uh, girl market. And now I'm working on uh, young adult books for uh, that same market. And, and I'm also doing a uh, G.I. Joe-related project, which I think we're going to be talking about. Hurrah! Looking forward to that project. But Before we get there, going backwards, uh, I had a question about Thundar the Barbarian. I'll admit that he was a little before my time. G.I. Joe was aimed just perfectly at my age group. But uh, my dad, well past his cartoon-watching years, and not normally a nerdy guy, for whatever reason, saw Thundar the Barbarian on TV and latched onto it. He liked it, and so he kept trying to get me to watch it as a kid. And I was just curious if you could explain uh, a little bit about your experience there, how you got roped in and maybe a favorite storyline or something like that. Well, um... Thunder the Barbarian was a creation of uh, Steve Gerber, Marty Pasco, and uh, Joe Ruby, who was the creative half of Ruby Spears Productions. Joe and Ken had been story editors in animated programs. Uh, they are probably the people most responsible for the creation of Scooby-Doo. And after they left Hanna-Barbera, they were forming their own company, I had started my career working at Filmation Studios, and after I left Filmation, I went over to Ruby Spears, and we were doing mostly um, short comedy-type shows. We did. Um, I worked on a show called Mighty Man and Yuck, which was about uh, a shrinking superhero and the world's ugliest dog. And the dog was so ugly, he had to wear a doghouse on his head, because otherwise people would go into shock when they saw him. Kind of a precursor to uh, Cobra Commander when you think about it. <laughs> I, kind of remember, uh, I remember that short. That's an anyway, um, I was there when uh, Steve Gerber came on board, and um, Steve and Joe and Marty together worked up this idea for Thundar the Barbarian. Marty was the uh, person who created the name Ookla because he had just come back from a trip to um, to France, and people had been wearing UCLA t-shirts, but they referred to them as UCLA because they didn't realize it stood for University of California, Los Angeles. <laughs> so he suggested UCLA as uh, Thundar's sidekick, and among the three of them, they came up with the basic idea of the show. Um, they brought in uh, an amazing talented crew of artists, and chief among those artists was Jack Kirby. Now, I obviously knew who Jack Kirby was by reputation, but I had never met Jack to that point, 
In fact, I had never even seen a picture of Jack at that point. I just knew him from his work. So we had this meeting where the uh, staff artists and the staff writers were meeting with Joe, and they were bringing in one or two outside artists. And I came into the room, and there was Steve talking with this um, you know, little old man who had a twinkle in his eye. And I mean that literally. I have never seen anybody with an actual twinkle except Jack Kirby. So I came in and sat down, and we started talking, and, and Jack had looked over the preliminary material, and he was throwing out ideas. And mind you, nobody had introduced us yet. We just started talking. And as other people came into the room, they all assumed everybody knew everybody else, and so the meeting just picked up, and we started, and we were kicking ideas around. And Jack and I hit it off well, and I remember thinking to myself, boy, this guy's really sharp. He's going to really be a, a wonderful addition to the, to the crew working on this. And after the meeting was over and Jack and uh, Roz, his wife, uh, left, I uh, said to Steve, you know, that guy's really sharp. I'm, I'm really going to enjoy working with him. And Steve said, that was Jack Kirby. And I just about went into shock. I said, that was Jack Kirby? I said, if I had known that, I wouldn't have been able to say anything. I would have just been going, da 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 I mean, it was just astonishing. And so I tell people I became friends with Jack Kirby before I even knew he was Jack Kirby. <laughs> wow. <laughs> awesome. I like that. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. yeah, we feel a little uh, awestruck to be talking with you. And Jack Kirby is definitely a, a star and a celebrity, just a legend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jack, Jack was such a wonderful person. I mean, everybody who knew him, um, everybody in my circle that knew him loved him. Uh we were, I was at San Diego Comic Con one year before it became huge, so big that, you know, it, it just became too crowded to really have fun at. But I was, uh, I, I bumped into Jack and Roz on the floor and, you know, just started chatting with them friend to friend. And as we were chatting, I looked around and about 20 feet around us was this ring of fans looking at Jack going, that's Jack Kirby, that's Jack Kirby. So, you know, Roz and I talked for a few minutes. Jack and Roz and I talked for a few minutes. And then we went our separate ways. I went down one aisle. He, he and Roz went down another. I looked behind me and there were like five or six guys following me going, he knows Jack Kirby. He knows. Wow. <laughs> also, that's your real claim to fame right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jack was a wonderful person. And Roz, too. They were wonderful. It's always neat to hear the personal side of people because we, we get to see what they made. We don't always get to know who they are. Exactly. It's neat to hear when they're when they're a person you'd actually want to be around, even if it wasn't just a something they've made. You know, they're actually a decent person or a fun person to be around. They were wonderful. I mean, they were two of the nicest people you could ever hope to meet. Uh, I visited them up their place in uh, Thousand Oaks a couple of times. Um, they were generous with their time. They were they were compassionate, uh, enthusiastic. I mean, Jack was just constantly brimming over with ideas. Roz had to drive him everywhere because Jack's mind was working on so many ideas simultaneously. He was a hazard behind the wheel. He had, he had nearly caused a couple of accidents. <laughs> Roz, <laughs> so you're not. You're not driving anymore. I'm doing all the driving from this. Wow. Jack Kirby's mind going at a thousand miles an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> shot me at all. Well, it uh, sounds like the highlight of Thunder was uh, meeting Jack Kirby. It it was. I mean, if there was if there was nothing else to it but that, it would have been in and of itself uh, wonderful. But what's interesting. Steve Gerber was suing Marvel Comics over the rights to Howard the Duck. Mm. And to fund his lawsuit, he launched one of the first uh, creator-owned comic books, um, Destroyer Duck, Manslaying Mallard on a Mission of Vengeance. And the, the plot line of Destroyer Duck was that Destroyer Duck came from the same duck world that Howard came from. And when he found out what had been done to Howard on Earth, he comes to Earth with the intent of uh, seeking justice. 
And Steve was working on this. He did the first two or three issues, but between work at Ruby Spears and other things, he was having a hard time staying on schedule. Not not to speak ill of, of Steve, because Steve was one of my best friends, but Steve on occasion had difficulty meeting deadlines. Mm. And so Steve asked me, would you be willing to write a, um, a two-page fight scene just so we can give Jack Kirby something to draw while I'm getting the rest of the script ready? Mm. And I'm going, well, I, you want me to write a two-page scene for Jack to draw? <laughs> Absolutely. How much do you want me to pay for that? Because uh, I was I was willing to I would have done it for free, but they gave me you know the the standard honorarium that they gave everyone who worked on the project. So I wrote a two page fight scene where um, a character called Destroyer Lawyer, who was based on Steve's uh, lawyer at that time, gets involved in a fight with one of the uh, supporting bad guys, and all the sound effects were legal terms. So it was it was kind of goofy. It was two pages. But I tell people my comics career started with, you know, a collaboration with Jack Kirby, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> well, if you start like that, where else can you go? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it was it was great and it was fun. And um, I had a wonderful time there. As a big G.I. Joe fan, I've always looked at, at Serpentor and Cobra Law and, and some of that stuff and always felt that, you know, even with you, you throw in the DNA and the genetic side, and, and I can kind of see making a monster in a laboratory kind of thing like that. But just some of the designs felt, felt so fantasy-based. Uh, do you think they, they would be a better fit for something more like Fantasy or Thundar than Joe? Did they stick out to you a little too much? Ab absolutely. It, it was a, a um, problem with me at the time, and it was not the best solution, but they didn't ask me for the best solution. They asked for several solutions, and I gave them a choice, and they, they chose all of them. Um, we, as a precursor to uh, what we'll be discussing in a little bit, the, uh, the upcoming Joe project that I'm working on, I had become the story editor for the second season of G.I. Joe. The first season, I was one of the assistant story editors, but I was promoted to full story editor for the second season. Mm. And I was starting to organize material, get people lined up to work on various scripts. And I thought, we don't know anything about the origin of Cobra. And I wanted to do a story that was going to touch on that, would be about how Cobra how Cobra's very genesis came about and how it led to the organization that it is now. And I pitched this idea to Hasbro. Hasbro was the toy company that owned Sunbow, the production arm. And Hasbro said, yeah, great, go for it. And, uh, oh, by the way, work in uh, uh, Cobra Emperor. And I said, excuse me? And they said, yeah, Cobra Emperor. He's... he's um, He's going to be a new character. And I said, well, where does he fit in? Oh, well, he's Cobra Commander's boss. And I said, well, where did he come from? And he said, he's always been there. I said, no, he hasn't. <laughs> we've, uh, we've never established that there was anybody over Cobra Commander. And if they had told us in the previous season, you know, plant some hints that there might be a bigger organization behind Cobra, mm -hmm. we could have done that. So it wouldn't have been a total shock. So I said, we have to explain where this character comes from. You can't drop a character of this magnitude into the series and just pretend he's always been there. So they said, okay, come up with a couple of ideas on where he came from. Well, they can either create the emperor. And that was what he was called before he became Serpentor. He was called King Cobra at one time. And then somebody said, well, you know, there's a malt liquor by that name. So they changed that pretty quick. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so they, I came up with two ideas. And the one that I liked the best was um, the one where they get the DNA from the various, you know, dictators and uh, military leaders of the past and create what in their mind will be the perfect leader for Cobra. The other idea, because they had asked, they being Hasbro, had asked for two or three, the other idea was that there was a secret organization behind Cobra, and that they were the ones who had been supplying them with money and arms and things of this nature. 
And I really wasn't very enthusiastic about that, but I, I decided I would, you know, put an idea together. And so I referred to the, to the, to the culture that it came from as Cobra La. And I did this because Shangri-La is the most famous lost civilization in literature. And I'm thinking to myself, nobody will be dumb enough to actually name this place Cobra La. They'll understand it's just a placeholder name and we'll come up with something better if they decide to go that way. Well, they liked both ideas. So we did the DNA for the um, Arise Serpentor Arise miniseries. And then we did Cobra La for the movie. And I agree with you, Cobra La is not a good fit for G.I. Yeah. Joe. It's the kind of thing that if it had been unrelated to Cobra, had been some lost civilization they found somewhere, it would have been a good single episode, and then you forget about it and never go back to it. Mm -hmm. But um, as the basis for Cobra, it was just wrong. And I think stuck with just creating this emperor, it would have given them the excuse and the ability to create any other new leader character they wanted to. Because once once you establish Cobra can create a new leader, leader whenever they want to, then you can bring in a new leader at any time. You just build a new one. So that's it. I found that aspect interesting even as a kid. I had my Cobra Commander ultimately be Serpentor because the design was what, and Cobra Law, that Cobra Law connection was was kind of odd. I liked monsters in the lab, but I liked the more uh, terrorist look, I guess, the more real world look. So I kind of combined those even as a kid. I agree with you. Um, we wanted to do something different because when in our discussions with Hasbro, they wanted to have a very distinctive look for the Cobra Law villains. Yeah. And we suggested, you know, organically based um, uh, weapons and, and equipment and things like this. I think Miyazaki's um, Nausicaa had just come out a short while before that. We're really impressed with the, the kind of um, uh, bio future that he was presenting in that. And the idea of doing something of that nature came along. Unfortunately, the designs that they came up with weren't equal to Miyazaki's designs. So, uh, don't get me wrong. I, I think uh, some of the design aspects are neat. I just, and on their own, like you said, I would really love them. In fact, I think there's something really neat about a snake-based organization kind of creating their own snake man. It's almost like they're building a, a, an idol or a god there. Uh, it seems kind of neat. Uh, it just seemed a little weird, so I thought I'd get your take on it. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up question, though. If you could pick a different name for Cobra Law and had to go with that story, what would you pick aside from Cobra Law for that same group? I honestly don't know what the final name would have been. If if I could have looked into the future and seen they would have gone with Cobra Law, I would have probably called it something like uh, Festering Monkey Hemorrhoid Island or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything... <laughs> Anything to keep them from using a dumb name. Right. <laughs> I like that. It's brilliant. So, uh, my question is about Cobra Commander. How is like his transition from season one as a human and, and find out that he's a snake man? Because he hinted he, you know, he was a human car salesman in previous episodes, and now in the second season up to the movie, is like he's like a snake man. There is one episode, and I can't remember the title of it right now, where Destro comes in while, Sno while Cobra Commander is eating, and we don't see Cobra Commander's face, but we see Destro kind of reacting in revulsion. Yeah, I remember and that. And I took that as the cue for what happened to Cobra Commander, the, the mutation with the multiple eyes on his face and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that, that always was planned, Dad. Yes, so I, I I just took that because I thought that would be that would be a way to tie it in with the whole DNA and and um, you know manipulating living life forms and things like that. Yeah, my reasoning was that the Galobulus and the other people at Cobra La would not want to run the the risk of their level of biological technology getting loose in the outer world. 
And so they would deliberately restrict the Cobra organization to mechanical and chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. um, only when it became absolutely imperative did they get involved directly and use the uh, various mutation things and whatnot as an intended weapon against the Joes. Well, that's yeah. logically consistent. And then, Alex, uh, you mentioned the car salesman thing. That's actually from the comic book. I don't, I don't recall any hints that that was the case in the. It tomb. was. Uh, there was. I think that was mentioned briefly with twenty questions with Hector Ramirez. Yeah. It was like briefly. It was. It was. It was answered. He was. It was briefly because he answered those questions on that episode with Hector Ramirez. Okay, maybe. Yeah. It's it's entirely possible. I know we were told by Hasbro not to be too anxious about tying in the two continuities. Yeah. Uh, the G.I. Joe comic book was slightly more violent in the sense that it alluded to death and, and injuries more than we could. Yeah. Um, I, I had been in the Army for six years, and one of the reasons that I was... Uh, hired as a staff writer and then as a story editor was that I could bring a certain amount of verisimilitude to the, to the proceedings. I understood how military protocol operated, how ranks, you know, worked with one another. Um, I could, I could keep people from making egregiously bad mistakes. We had, we had one script where a sergeant was giving orders to a general and I said, no, that doesn't happen in the real world. That's that's yeah. not gonna, you know, be the you know the way the Joes operate. So, so sorry, I was gonna I, say it would both, make sense in Arise Serpento Arise Part One when you have uh, you know the we see the official Joe chain of command. Exactly, and one of the things that that irked me about the TV show was that they tried to pretend nobody ever got hurt in this. And I managed to get this much of a concession from Hasbro. I was allowed to uh, injure characters as long as it was implied that they would be, you know, healed and back by the next mission. So in every episode I wrote, I tried to have at least one Joe be seriously injured to indicate to the kids, you know, this it's not fun in games. War is where people get hurt. And then I, I realized I could refer to casualties, and Hasbro wouldn't be aware that casualties meant both killed and injured. So if you oh, would see an episode and one of the, one of the Joes would say, we suffered 20% casualties, Hasbro thought it meant, well, 20% of the Joes got hurt. It actually meant some people got killed. I just couldn't come right out and say that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, yes, I remember in um, one episode you wrote, uh, um, the one where a ship, uh, the most dangerous thing in the world, you know, Beachhead towards the end of the episode actually states that, you know, the Joe, Joes have suffered serious casualties in the yeah. Cobra attack. You know, and they're right. forced back to, you know, last man standing at the pit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I didn't want the idea that this kind of combat is is a lighthearted, fun thing. It's I saw in my mind a distinction between Transformers, which are robots pounding the crap out of other robots, and <laughs> and G.I. Joe, which is soldiers blasting away at one another with what in the real world would be extremely deadly weapons. Yeah. Um you probably know this, but when we were doing the G.I. Joe movie, they, they they had planned to drop Duke from the toy line. And I said, well, um, let's yeah. let's capitalize on that. If you're not going to have Duke as part of the Joes anymore, let's kill him off in the movie. Let's let's actually have somebody die in one of these episodes. And I convinced them to do it. And so we, we originally wrote the script where Duke gets killed. However, the Hasbro people liked Duke getting killed so much that they told the people doing the Transformers movie, kill Optimus Prime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. The problem is, when you've got a robot, you can bash that robot all to bits, and then all you got to do is repair him, and he's back on the job. Hmm. So killing a robot does not have the same connotation as killing a human being. 
Yeah. Secondly, um, the Joe audience average age was about 12. And the 12-year-old understands, at least intellectually, that people can get killed in war. Transformers average age was about 9 or 10. And they're mm -hmm. not quite up to speed on that. So the Transformers movie came out first. Optimus Prime is killed. Thousands of kids are traumatized by this. Mm -hmm. We're getting phone calls. We're getting letters. How could you do this? You know, we went in for a fun... You know, and so then Hasbro says, well, you can't kill Duke off. Well, we've already animated it. So they put in a very clumsy line of dialogue that he's in a coma. And then uh, at the very end, there's a little overdub line where he's he's recovered. Um, no, he's not. He's dead. He's really most sincerely dead. Yeah, because well, I really appreciated it. it. In the um, Japanese dub of the G.I. Joe movie, apparently they did keep Duke dead. Yeah, it was the, it was the overlock. I mean, it was the in the Japanese yeah laser disc. It's obvious that Duke dies. You know the the fact you know the way Scarlet is talk, referring, actually clearly saying, "Please, Duke, don't die." Yeah, and, and the way um you know the way Doc you know just looks at General Hulk and gives that look as if to say, "No good." Yeah. It undercut our movie, and it really didn't add anything to the Transformers movie, because guess what? The next Transformers project they did, Optimus Prime comes back. Yeah, I hated that as a kid, because I love that. Has a zombie. Yep. Yeah. I love that sacrifice as a kid, so I really appreciate it. And I, I definitely appreciated the, the realism that Joe had that nothing else had. I mean, if Duke was supposed to die and just Deke just resurrected him and, and the, the Deke version of G.I. Yeah, Joe just resurrected him out of the blue. Yeah. I I have no idea what Deke did with um, um, their projects. I know several of the people who worked on the show and they were they were happy with what they wrote. They weren't necessarily happy with the way Deke executed it. Mm. But uh, I was I was on to other projects by that point. Mm. Ah, yeah. I mean, I mean, their opener, that opener, um, Operation Dragonfire was sort of like tied the Sumbo and Deep universes together into a coherent storyline. But then after that, you know, they just sort of went their own way. Yeah, uh, the, around town when they when people call refer to Deke. Um, it's it. They say D I C stands for Do It Cheaper. Um, <laughs> they were notorious for cutting corners, and um, well, let's just leave it at that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna work up ahead of steam here, but they were they were notorious for cutting corners. Yeah. And the the one or two times I had to work with them. Um, I honestly thought, you know, we could we could just hold up a series of still images and do, do a better job than than they could animating this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we've spoken a little bit about GI Joe, and I, I I really have to mention is a lot of fans have you know noticed that what a lot of people refer to as the Sunbow Shed continuity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fact that Transformers, G.I. Joe, and uh, Inhumanoids, and Gem all take place in one universe and city. Well, or, you know, United States of that um, timeline. So I thought we'd, uh, you know, discuss that a little bit. You know, I, I, I'll, I'm i going to have to say the most obvious thing would be Hector Ramirez. He is the linking factor, and we backed into it for this reason. Uh, every time you write an episode and you write a character's name, unless it is some completely fantastical name, like, you know, Princess Dragon Mom out of Inframan or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but if you're, if you're writing a real name, like, let's say, Bill Carson, because I just happened to watch The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly again last night. Oh, yeah. awesome. Nice movie. If you um, write a character's name, the legal department looks to see if that character's name matches any real person's name. Now, obviously, with most people, you're going to find a match somewhere. The question is, are you going to find a match that is so unique that person could say, hey, you picked my name to base 
a character on and I want money for it. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a reporter in America who I had a very low opinion of named Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. And he had done some very sensationalistic um, type reporting that was just just plain dumb stuff. And as kind of a, a send up of Geraldo Rivera, I created Hector Ramirez. You know, um, yeah. he looks like Geraldo Rivera. The name Hector Ramirez was an allusion to Geraldo Rivera. They run him through, they check him off, they say, okay, you can use the name Hector Ramirez in, in reference to a newscaster. Yep. Well, next time they needed a newscaster in, I think, um, um, a Transformers episode, somebody said, well, instead of creating a news, uh, a brand new newscaster character, let's just use the one that's already been approved for G.I. Joe. So from that point on, whenever they needed a talking head to come out and explain something on the news, Hector Ramirez got tapped. Yep. So as a result, ah. every, every time, uh, all of the series are linked by that. Hector is the person who, who ties them all in together because yeah. he is the newscaster in every single one of them. Yeah. Now, who where he doesn't appear uh, are visionaries, which is set on a different world and a different time stream. And so it's kind of hard to work Hector into that one. And uh, obviously My Little Pony. Yeah. Now, the funny thing is, the first draft of the My Little Pony movie would have had two brief crossover screen scenes with Transformers and with G.I. Joe. One of the ponies is sent on a mission to go and, um, you know, find some magic MacGuffin to help the other ponies. She takes off. She goes to the Transformers. Optimus Prime says, sorry, can't help you. She continues flying, she goes to Joe base, and she flies in, and Shipwreck is sitting on the back of one of the barracks drinking a beer, and she flies up to him and says, can you help me, I'm looking for the magic MacGuffin, and his eyes go wide, and he doesn't say anything, he just stays frozen, and she says, well, okay, and she flies off, and he throws the bottle away, and he swears he'll never drink again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, uh, it was my intention to tie all of the series in, but we never, we never managed to get to that. Well, well, was that down to Sumbo's internal politics, wanting to try and keep Transformers as Transformers, G.I. Joe as G.I. Joe, and so on and so forth? Um, pretty much. Uh, they also felt, in the case of um, My Little Pony, that My Little Pony represented a significantly different type of story and, and approach to story than what we did. Hmm. You could say that um, all the other series, they worked in the real world insofar as physics worked, chemistry worked, machines operated the same way, there were cities, there were laws, there was, there was a common background culture for yeah. all of them. Yeah. Even humanoids, they were they were monsters with supernatural powers, but they were not supernatural powers that were whimsical fantasy. They were, for lack of a better word, plausible supernatural powers. Yeah. Little Pony oh, yeah. was much more fantastical, much more whimsical and whatnot, uh, as well as looking entirely different. So they were, I think they made the right choice in saying the Pony world, you know, never crosses over into the other worlds. Right now, it's the one that's uh, got a phenomenon behind it, as much as it's different than my taste. Uh, although I completely understand Shipwreck and, and his beer probably didn't belong in a My Little Pony movie, unless uh, innuendo, you can get past them. That might be a little obvious. But, yeah, maybe that's uh, Joe's uh, chance at, at regaining their fame. We need to get that cameo back in somehow. And... Um, um... The other thing I want to say, I'm assuming this is why, you know, you used Hector Ramirez and slipped in, you know, little cameos throughout the series here and there, you know, sort of like Ace from G.I. Joe appearing in, in Humanoids as Sabre Jet, Dana from the October Guard being in Prime Target. Yeah. We, um, we would do that, uh, very frequently. We would, you know, if you needed a character and there was another character that had already been 
approved, it, it was very easy to just work that one in. I mean, you've already got the model sheets designed for them. You've already got a voice cast for them. At that point, just, well, use this guy. And, and it worked. A lot of times, uh, a Joe character would, would be retired from the toy line. And we, some allusion to, you know, what happened to that character. And in a couple of cases, we, we indicated, uh, a Joe character had, had, uh, retired and gone into industry. Uh, so he might, he might pop up in Transformers or something like that as a supporting character. And it was no master plan to tie everything together. It was, you know, the series are similar enough to one another that nobody would react in surprise if the character showed up. Though I have to say, in talking to you, um, I wish now I had thought at the time with Once Upon a Joe, when they were telling the fairy tale to use Joe ponies, because yeah. that would have that would have done it. That would have tied yeah. them all in. <laughs> so it's easier to sort of explain why General Hawks at an army base in uh, Transformers or in Humanoids, for example. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it, and, and the truth was Hasbro, you know, obviously knew that their kids were, you know, the kids that bought the toys were not keeping them in separate toy boxes and only playing with them one at a time. I mean, I'm sure there must have been some kids like that, but the average kid drags out his Transformers and his Joes and his Inhumanoids and, and, you know, bashes them all together. So that's great. That's, that's what it's for. Let's let's go for a theoretical question, if you will, Buzz. Um, is there another property that you would have loved to have worked on from the 80s or any period even today? It's kind of hard to say because um, I got to work on so many that I wanted to work on. Um, I got to work on Superman for one season. I oh, love, yeah. I love that show. I got to work on um, the Buck Rogers comic book. TSR, the company that at that time owned Buck Rogers, they launched a line of what they call comics modules, which were uh, comic book stories with, you know, standalone games on the inside of them. Ah. I, got to, I got to work on uh, Buck Rogers, and Buck Rogers was one of the iconic things in my childhood. I remember when I was five years old, I saw a Sunday Buck Rogers comic strip where Buck and his human friends were playing water polo with some Venusians. And the Venusians looked like the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> and so, so Buck and his friends, they're wearing diving masks and whatnot with oxygen tanks so they can breathe underwater while they're playing uh, water polo with these um, these Venusians. The game is over. And... Buck and his friends get out of the pool and take their masks off. The Venusians come out and put fishbowl helmets full of water on their heads so they can keep breathing out of the water. I'm five years old, and I'm looking at this, and I'm going, yeah, that's the way it would work. And this was like this was like one of the moments that really got me hooked on science fiction when I was a kid. Mm. Ah. Um, so Buck Rogers was like really one of my childhood icons, and I loved the opportunity to work on Buck. Past that, um, I know Flash Gordon was done at Filmation, and I didn't get a chance to work on Flash Gordon when it was done there. And later, Flash Gordon was part of, I think, the Defenders of the Universe or something like that. Yeah, and Defenders of the Earth. Yeah. Defenders of the Earth, if if I had had the chance just to be able to say I did a Flash Gordon story, I would have loved to have done that. I did a um, Scrooge McDuck story for uh, Disney Comics, so I was able to write, you know, a Scrooge McDuck story. That was another childhood icon that I always wanted to do. Pretty much I got the chance to do everything that I wanted to, to write on. And uh, the ones that I didn't, well, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in the other well, the other question I got. This is Transformers related again. Sorry about this. Um, um, what was what is your view regarding the somewhat mixed reaction to Carnage and C minor? You got to understand how things were done at Sunbow. 
we had, uh, the analogy we gave was that we had a freight train that had to pull out every day. And yeah. the freight train had to have a certain number of cars on it in order for the system to keep working. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you basically, uh, uh, Flint Dilly came up with this. He said, you get a script, you fix the two things you hate the most on it, you slap a bow tie on it, and you kick it out the door. That and, sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, Carnage in C minor, um, you know, what can I tell you? They can't all be the God Gambit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the, the origin for that goes back to Filmation Studios, actually. Because uh, uh, at one, I... Lou Scheimer, the producer of Filmation, uh, between seasons asked me to develop, you know, show ideas, and I came up with a literally dozens of different ideas. And one of the ideas was about a character who could uh, do superhero things using a uh, synthesizer. She carried a synthesizer and. Depending upon which arrangements of notes she played, something could happen. And I thought it would be a pretty easy show to animate because, you know, you just basically have the same, um, uh, you know, she stands there and hits the synthesizer and then you show something happening. Well, it didn't get picked up, but the idea of using music to do things stuck in my head and it ended up in um, uh, Transformers. I see. Not to mention the whole um, standing behind an instrument thing would probably fit Filmation's stock system to a T. They had a stock system like you wouldn't believe. We would we would get uh, these thick books of uh, storyboard scenes, stock animation. Yeah. We would be told, write your script and call for specific scenes to be used. Um, I told you earlier that Deke was called Do It Cheaper. Well, before Deke, Filmation really knew how to stretch a budget. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons that Filmation's shows were so well written was that it was easier to write interesting dialogue and just show characters blinking as they listen to another character say something interesting than it was to actually animate it. So there was a, a huge amount of that. Um, the last four episodes of uh, Fat Albert, there was no original animation in them at all. It was completely stock animation from earlier episodes. They could just mix and match the stuff and fit it, fit it together, and, uh, you know, it worked. Hmm. Ah, that makes sense. I recall that your shipper was your, like, favorite character of yours. Is there any other favorite character t- to write? Oh, I I always tried to throw um, Scatman Crothers' work whenever I did uh, uh, Transformers because I I Scatman was a great guy and he was fun to hang around with, and so if if uh, I wrote him into a script, I get to go to the uh, recording session, so yeah. you know, I'd find something for him to do, and he'd sometimes say, "How come I only get one line in this?" And he said, "Well, I wanted to hang out, you know." So. That also explain the involvement of Jazz in the God Gambit. Yeah. Jazz yeah. is my favorite, so I, I appreciate that. Jazz, yeah. hey, Jazz and Hong Kong Philly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to Joe a little bit, kind of slowing, slowly transitioning, uh, headed towards your going in your project. I know there were so many Joes that did so many different things, and you could plug different Joes in uh, depending on the mission. Were there any roles that you felt were vacant, like you wanted to have this for a story, but you didn't have that Joe who could do it, or he wasn't on the shelf anymore, maybe? We never had that problem, because generally when they replaced uh, a Joe, they when they when they moved an old one out of the product line, at some point they replaced him with a Joe who had a, a similar enough function that we could use him instead. Um we had a lot of what we called ND Joes. And if you remember the very earliest miniseries, you would see these Joes in, uh, uh, I, if I remember correctly, dark trousers, khaki shirts, and, and caps. And the rationale was these were the Joes who were, um, 
I don't want to say auditioning, but they were trying out to be Joes. They were they were brought into the team to see how well they functioned, and if they if they passed, you know, if they passed their their audition, for lack of a better word, then they would be promoted to full Joe status, and they would get a, a code name, and they would be allowed to, you know, uh, customize their uniform as they needed and things like that. So if we needed a Joe janitor, we just simply tapped one of the ND Joes to be uh, the Joe janitor. Mm. Um, <laughs> wow. We did Bridget. it once, and, and it, it's, it, it got to be a little off color, so I'm not going to repeat all of them. But we had uh, we were coming up with alternate uh, Joe names uh, for, for new characters, and... Um, we had we had like uh, the general's driver had a name that I can't repeat because it was uh, you know she was uh, she was obviously servicing more than the jeep let's just put it that way <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we had another Joe that we were going to call fodder f o d d e r and he was going to be a, a big fat Joe with a target on his chest and his job was to go out and draw all the fire on it. Uh, <laughs> I think that was the, I think that the job was for the fridge for that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we we never had a we never had an opportunity to um, create a brand new Joe for ourselves that that fit a a unique job that no other Joe could do. We could always find a Joe somewhere in the product line. I mean, at one point we had eighty six characters. Uh, in the show, and that was 86 product line characters. It didn't include Hector Ramirez. It didn't include. Um, we had we had one female Joe called Mary L. And early in the series, when we only had one or two female Joes, we felt there had to be at least one other Joe, female Joe in the unit. And so Mary L. appears typically in um, flight line scenes. She was one of the mechanics that worked on the jets and the helicopters. So, um, and the L. stood for lesbian. So, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> the, uh, now that that news is out, there's going to be a, some kind of blog and a fan demand that that be put in the next figure subscription I, service. I hate, to say, up... <laughs> I, I hate to make a bad joke, but now we know. They always <laughs> have to battle. Yeah. <laughs> I did like two or three episodes, and as I said, she was she was just there when we needed to indicate, you know, these aren't the only two female Joes. There are there are more in the unit. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about, you know, um, I, I've got to say this, you know, Sergeant Slaughter being a celebrity at the time and appearing in GI Joe. I mean, were there any other big name celebrities planned to appear in, you know, GI Joe and Transformers, maybe? I I have to repeat the official Hasbro um, line that Rocky Balboa never, ever, ever was intended <laughs> to be a member of uh, the G.I. Joe team. No matter how many mock-ups and uh, magazine articles you saw to the contrary. Mm. <laughs> and can still see to the contrary on showdeclassified.com or, yeah, but, <laughs> or yeah, many other places. It's just it's yeah. a bit odd seeing that you know Rocky Balboa in the Order of Battle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and well, I was—I remember asking when we first saw him. I said, "Well, does he take the gloves off?" No, he wears the gloves at all time. Well, that's going to be interesting. Have him <laughs> diffuse a bomb in those things. Now he goes to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, they gotta diffuse his bomb, you know. So you know, think about you know Rocky wearing what, taking one of those generic Joe rifles with wearing boxing gloves. Yeah. <laughs> or trying, yeah. or trying to drive an all striker. Yeah. The, uh, you know, obviously what yanked him from it was that he sold the rights to Rocky Balboa to G.I. Joe and then turns around and sells the rights to um, Rambo to a, a different company. Yeah. And the Hasbro people felt irritated by this. And so they yanked Rocky Balboa from the, the product line. But at one point, there was serious discussion in Hollywood about doing a Rocky, a live action Rocky Rambo crossover where basically Rocky is on a uh, goodwill tour boxing people in other countries and uh, terrorists capture him and so Rambo has to go in to rescue him. And 
I gotta say, it's not the dumbest idea anybody ever came up with. It's the 80s. It, it, yeah. ain't, anything dumb turns into gold. Yeah, yep. exactly. Especially since, you know, for most of the movie, they could have just had a, a generic actor, where you know, in a dark room with a bag over his head tied up and no one would know the difference. Yeah. While they have, you know, Sly Sloan play Rambo. Apart yeah. from when he tried to talk. But they could just overdub the lines. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I, I have to, you know, make mention of this. Um, yeah, your, your work on Sumbo stuff, I mean, you've said a little bit about it. Yeah, have you really watched anything of the current product and, and the direction it's been? And you've been, wow, wow, I like this. Um, not on a regular basis, but yes, I have seen things and gone, yeah, that's pretty good. I wish we had thought of that, or I wish we had had the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, one of the things about our unique point in time with Sunbow was that the 1970s had very strict controls on children's television, and mm. uh, they, we used to say they sprayed everything with fun away. And when G.I. Joe and Transformers came along, we were allowed to do the kind of slam-bang action that we, we really weren't allowed to do on um, regular Saturday mornings. Yeah, it's, yeah. what was it? How some um, Flint Dilly once put it, the Scooby-Doo era. In the 1970s, uh, kids' shows were very restricted. We were not allowed to do the kind of action-adventure or tackle certain topics and things. <laughs> Were able to do in the 80s. When we did Thundar, he could only fight robots or non-living things like clay monsters, stuff like that. We were not allowed to do person-on-person -person violence or Thundar fighting an animal if the animal was going to be hurt. When G.I. Joe and Transformers came along, everybody was happy to have a chance to do, you know, full bore action adventure. And everybody's first script was just a, a balls to the wall, blow everything up, punch everybody, just fight, fight, fight. And then after we got it out of our system, we said, well, do we have to do this the next time? Can we do something different the next episode we write? And I think the reason our shows succeeded as well as they did and are remembered as fondly as they were was because we were given the... Um, ability to explore other things with those characters instead of just doing the same slam bang 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 violence over and over again yeah. some of the other toy based shows of that time they don't stand up because they were just about you know smash bash and destroy when I see people taking shows that we worked on and continuing on with them and doing things with them and going beyond where we did, I'm very happy because I look at it as we we set up the first rung of that ladder and I'm happy for anybody who's able to climb higher than us. Um, I'm a little envious in that I wish we could have done some of the stuff that they did, but you know, they wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't taken that first step. So. Yeah, I, from what I remember Flint Dilly saying once, the way, you know, censorship worked back then, it, it, you could sort of have the hero get thrown into a dungeon by the villain with a snake, but the snake was not allowed to go for the hero straight away. It would have to sort of crawl ever so slowly around a rock, then see the villain, you know, see the hero before going in for the kill. We That literally happened in a development we did for Ruby Spears called Roxy's Raiders. And Roxy's Raiders was essentially a ripoff of Raiders of the Lost Ark with mm. uh, circus freaks. There's no nice way of saying it. Mm. Uh, but in one of the, in one of the uh, proposals, one of the, the scripts that was prepared for this show that in, never got into production, the bad guy ties Roxy up to a post floods the room waist deep in water and then releases uh, uh, two snakes. And the network said, you have to put rocks between Roxy and the snakes so the snakes don't see her directly when they come out. They have to swim around the rock and then they see her. And we yeah. got used to 
kidding me? And they said, no, 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 because if the person, if the bad guy releases the snakes and they see her directly, then he's doing something harmful. But if he just releases the snakes and the snakes happen to find, then he's not. Oh. Um, you know, I mentioned I had just seen um, uh, re rewatch The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly recently. And yep. when, when Clint Eastwood abandons Eli Wallach in the desert, 70 miles from the nearest town, with no food, no water, no protection from the sun, and says, you know, you conserve your energy, you might make it. Well, technically, he isn't trying to kill him. Okay, he's not really trying to kill him, but come on, what is what does any logical person think is going to happen in that situation? Yeah, right. True. Uh, I think this is going to be pretty much last question before you uh, go into your uh, book work. All right. The, the last question I think you know we've all been wondering is you know with all the um, Sumbo stuff that's recently been getting mo live action movies, you know like G.I. Joe and Transformers and the upcoming movie by uh, John Chu, uh, Gem. Is there anything you think that you you know you worked on that could possibly work in that whole live action theme? Well, um, in humanoids, I think could make a very good live action movie. Uh, if you if you saw Pacific Rim, you you saw a lot of overlap between the ideas in in, in humanoids and the ideas in Pacific Rim. Yeah, uh, yeah. Visionaries was. The toy line was so specific to what it did that I don't see the point in reviving Visionaries under that name, but I think the stories we told and the types of adventures we had uh, indicate that kind of a story you know, could work. I'm very happy about the Gem movie. I'm looking forward to it. I, I hope they do a great job with it. I think they have that potential. Um, I'm sure I'm overlooking one or two other smaller projects that we did at Sunbow, but um, I I can't think of anything that wouldn't make a good show if it had a good script. Yeah. Before, ah. before, before we move on, I, I, just one last point. I, I have to say this. Can we please petition John M. Chu to put uh, Hector Ramirez in the Gem movie? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and, and at I least put it Sorry, and at least put Hector Ramirez in the upcoming G.I. Joe 3. We knew I, this I was have, coming, Buzz. Yeah, I have no control over that character. He's He is owned and operated by Hasbro, and it would be it would be a delight to see him on the screen, I'll say that. So, I mean, we've got your uh, career out of the way, and, you know, some of the we've got questions about that out of the way. So let's get to the, the crux of the podcast now. Um, the why don't you tell page. us a little bit about some of the books you're working on in this The Most Dangerous Man in the World? Well, uh, to reiterate what I said a bit earlier, after uh, I had worked in animation for um, a, a number of years, I was the Vice President of Creative Affairs for Stan Lee in uh, the year 2000. Uh, Stan asked me to develop a comic book for the Christian market, and he was hoping I would develop a superhero, and I came up with a um, what I call a comedic soap opera for teens. And so Stan and I had an amicable parting of the ways. I went out and developed this, uh, this story, Serenity, and we did... 10 volumes of Serenity, and we did uh, 10 volumes of other uh, stories and whatnot for the uh, young adult market, the tween to teen girl market, from about 2007, excuse me, strike that, 2006 to 2007. And we had a good run with it, but uh, the, the publisher we were working with just drew an arbitrary line and said, Anybody who hasn't sold X number of units by a certain date, we're cutting them off. And we kept telling them, no, this, these characters need to be out on a regular basis so people will be anticipating them and the interest will grow. These are not one-of-a-kind books that, you know, um, you, you sell just that volume. They didn't, they didn't agree with us. They cut us loose. And then, of course, within months, the whole ebook phenomenon starts building up 
but um, at that point we were separated from them and we couldn't get back on steam. Mm -hmm. So to keep these ideas that I had developed and worked on, I have been developing a series of novels, many of them for the uh, tween market, uh, young adult market, but some of them are going to also be branching off into the adult market as well. The first one that is going to come out um, will be out very shortly. It's called um, Banished Children of Eve. And I describe it as a World War II era Lord of the Flies with Catholic schoolgirls. It's about um, a group of girls who are being evacuated from the Philippines on the eve of World War II. Their plane is shot down and the handful of survivors and a novice nun uh, wash ashore on a deserted island uh, while World War II was raging all around them. So that's coming out very, very shortly. I don't have the uh, ISBN number on it to, to relay to you, but if you look for Banished Children of Eve in uh, Kindle on Amazon, you'll find it pretty soon. The other one that I'm working on right now, uh, the next one that'll come out, uh, is kind of an interruption in my series of books for, for young adults. The next one is going to be um, the lost G.I. Joe episode, uh, The Most Dangerous Man in the World. And as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, my original intention uh, had been to do a story about the origin of, G of uh, Cobra. And before Serpentor was in my idea was that there had been a philosopher, kind of a Friedrich Nietzsche or a Karl Marx, the equivalent uh, person for Cobra. And this person had come up with basically the, the operating philosophy for Cobra, the, the entire rationale for Cobra existing. The thing is, as with Nietzsche and as with Marx, the people who took their ideas then proceeded to misapply them, to twist them around, turn them into totalitarian governments. And this is what Cobra Commander had done with this guy's philosophy. But Cobra Commander fe feels he owes this guy enough not to just kill him off. So they have kept this guy in solitary confinement in a Cobra prison for um, you know years and years. He finally figures out a way of escaping. And when he does escape, all of Cobra's operations worldwide come to a screeching halt as Cobra Commander reassigns everybody to find this one missing prisoner. Well, when the Joes figure out what's going on, that Cobra is now looking for this escaped prisoner, who the Joes prior to this didn't even know existed, now the Joes are out looking for him as well. And so when they find him, they uh, realize that he's the guy who has the potential of completely undermining Cobra, because if he gets out and says, no, they're doing it all wrong, I never meant it this way, then he can uh, destroy Cobra's ability to recruit new members and to get people involved in the organization. So in the end, he escapes from the Joes as well, and the Joes figure, well, you know, just let him go, because he's kind of a difficult person to deal with, and whatever he does out there, it's going to hurt Cobra more than it hurts us. Any featured Joes who are going to be in the book? Uh, well, you can bet that Shipwreck is going to be in it. Um, I, I looked at the cast list, and I decided quite arbitrarily, because, hey, it's going to be my book, um, that Serpentor and none of the Cobra Law characters were going to be in it. I am approaching this from the point of view that Cobra Law does not exist. Um, they have not yet created Serpentor, and this is simply Cobra Commander and the rest of the existing Cobra characters at that point. I'm including all of the second season Joes who had been introduced at that point because prior to Serpentor being dropped on us, we had already been given um, uh, detailed descriptions on all the other new Joe characters. So I'm including them. Um, I'm going to try to give as many characters some kind of, of page time as possible. They may, you know, they may just be in the... Uh, in the scene with several other people. They may have uh, key points to the story, but uh, for the most part, I'm gonna try to give as many 
favorites opportunities to to do something in the story as I can. Basing it on the the traditional G.I. Joe three-act structure, uh, but exactly how long it's going to run, I couldn't tell you. We say book because all of the the um, Kindle stories, the Kindle worlds is what this is referred to, all of them are referred to as books regardless of the actual length of the story. Uh, this is part of, so that the readers will understand this. Amazon has made a deal with uh, several different companies, including Hasbro, that people can write fan fiction based on those characters and publish it for sale through Kindle and split the proceeds with the, the, uh, the original rights holders. So when I saw this, I thought, well, I always wanted to do this story. I never had a, a venue to do it in. This is the perfect opportunity and place to do it. I can, I can tell the story the way I wanted to tell it, uh, tell it the way I understood Cobra to have been formed in my mind, and then just let people read it as kind of an alternate history of G.I. Joe. When Kindle well, Words was a, a world, I'm sorry. When Kindle Worlds was announced, I was curious, but I had never dreamed that somebody like you who had been attached to the brand professionally would go back and revisit stuff. And that just blew me away. Is that something that normally happens? Are you aware of anyone else doing that with a Kindle Worlds deal or anyone else? Maybe I, uh, another professional you know uh, going to do similar in the future? I, I am not aware but I would say this, um, there were any number of people who pitched ideas to us that were good but not right at the moment, if you know what I mean. They would, they would have an idea that we'd go, well, you know, that really doesn't kind of fit in with where we're trying to take the series this year. And it's not that it was a bad idea or the person was uh, not a good writer. It was just not the thing for us at that time. I certainly hope some of these writers, uh, if they still remember those stories and want to do them, follow through on it. I was really revved up about this. I mean, I, I had been, uh, the trader was probably my favorite working experience ever in animation. Uh, it, the story came out produced as close to what I imagined it as any story I had ever worked on. So I was very happy with that. And with the most dangerous man in the world, I was looking forward to something similar because I really had a lot of ideas that I wanted to bring out and explore in this. And unfortunately, Cobra Law shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, I, this one episode I really want to see it explore is that G.I. Joe Altered Dimension, The World Without End. I, <clears throat> I, re I really wanted to see, like, ex explore how, you know, Cobra won. Yeah, either half the Joe team is dead or in resistance, or, or a storyline after that. That what uh, Clutch, um, Runt, and um, what was the other guy's name? Uh, what was the other guy? Uh, it was Grunt and Steeler, Steeler, wasn't it? Steeler, Steeler, like something like what 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 happened to them? Like after that episode, he was like two of those storylines would have been good. I, I would love to see that. I was going to mention earlier, Alex, when you mentioned. Uh... I think it was you that mentioned Duke returned in uh, the Deke cartoons out of the blue. Uh, so did Grunt, I believe, as well. So maybe they found uh, Duke hiding out in the alternate world or something and brought him back. Uh, the nice thing about Kindle Worlds is that you do not have to strictly adhere to the continuity that Hasbro has established. It's, it's understood that these are alternate takes alternate understandings and approaches to the material. Now, they, they obviously have certain limitations, and it will break your heart to know that uh, Sergeant Slaughter cannot be part of the Kindle Worlds, because apparently they don't have a deal with him. Uh, the refrigerator can't be part of it either. I would say this for anybody who's listening to the podcast, if you've got a G.I. Joe idea that you always wanted to do, you've now got a place to do it. I think it's also because, uh, you know, the fridge being, you know, NFL and Sergeant Slaughter being still part of the WWF or WWE as it's known now. Yeah, they retain those rights and not, not Hasbro yeah. anymore. 
Yeah, yeah something like that. So your stories could feature, uh, right, butcher, uh, freezer, and uh, let's see, what can I do for another one? You, you get I the know. idea. <laughs> I will probably not. I, I toyed with the idea of referring to a character as the Sarge, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to brush up against it because mm. uh, it, it, it will not add significantly to the story because I can't really do anything with him. But yeah. I do want to take some of the other characters that we had that uh, didn't get as much screen time necessarily as they should have. And I want to explore some of the um, uh, ramifications of some of the other characters as well. I think uh, Devil, well, I know Devil's Due Press uh, featured Slaughter kind of just of not officially Slaughter, but you could tell it was him. Uh, dressing down some recruits in in one issue of their comics, and they kind of got away with that. But that was a visual medium, and you can kind of stick a cameo in the back and not get too much attention, just enough. Yeah. You know? The Sarge always based his uh, appearance on the stereotypical military drill sergeant of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines. Um, so he has already a very generic look to him deliberately so and you could you know you 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 have a big muscular guy with uh with uh what we call the smoky the bear hat (laughs) mustache you know he's either one of the village people or he's sergeant slaughter yeah my favorite quote in gi joe is has always been that man has the constitution of a vending machine (laughs) (laughs) It's just I, yeah. I went through a phase where I disliked Slaughter uh, growing up, but I loved him as a kid. And then I kind of returned to that. He's just so bigger, uh, larger than life. But yet he does have a little more grounding than, than some other characters. So I, I reappreciated yeah. him. Except when except when we got in, uh, you know, a rise of Pentor or a rise when he beats up an entire platoon of uh, bats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's well, like he he's the most broken character in the G.I. Joe series. And uh, and then, you know, he's the guy that single-handedly takes down Nemesis Enforcer in the climax of the G.I. Joe movie. We used him to extreme because he was such an extreme character. He he is and I'm saying this with great affection cuz cuz I I know him and he's a he's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. But he is he is very much over the top. He is a living cartoon, and I'm saying that in a positive sense. His <laughs> his job in public is to be Sergeant Slaughter, and he does Sergeant Slaughter better than anybody else. <laughs> I got that as a kid. I got it as an adult. I got it uh, eventually. That just that it there's some humor behind it. He's a little larger than life, and yeah, you know, uh, the other was, shows are a little more serious, and they're not going to take out a platoon of bats. But oh, Slaughter. He was, originally um, a bad guy in the WWF before it became the WWE mm-hmm. and they would they would taunt him with Gomer whenever he would come out to refer to Gomer Pyle oh I remember <laughs> I, saw, I saw I saw a video of that recently yeah. of him and then they turned him in one single brilliant moment they had the iron sheet beat the crap out of somebody because this was right on the tail end of the whole um, Iranian hostage crisis. The Iron Sheik Sheik beats up somebody, and as he's coming out of the ring, there's Slaughter standing there, blocking his way. And he demands Slaughter move, and Slaughter won't move, and the crowd just starts yelling and cheering and going, USA, USA. And I realize, you know, for some people, that's, you know, (laughs) not necessarily a good thing anymore, but uh, it was brilliant the way they turned him from a heel into an angel in just the blink of an eye. Yeah. And after that, those two had some of the most amazing wrestling matches I've ever seen. I mean, it was every time they were on, I would watch them because they really worked that ring. Could that also be some of the inspiration as to the, um, you know, Sergeant Slaughter versus Nemesis Enforcer battle? Not directly, other than, you know, we, we had to put their biggest, baddest guy up against our biggest, baddest guy to have the, the face off. They also wouldn't let me do what I originally wanted to do with Globulus. <clears throat> the yeah. The original idea I wanted was that this big, rotund um, 
Charles Lawton as Nero type character would be Galobulus. Mm. He would look like a human being, but he would just be big and fat and pudgy. He's carried everywhere he goes. He's on a litter. He's being attended by people. They're dropping grapes in his mouth, or I guess live rodents in his mouth, things like this. And he never moves except for the very end. Yeah. And in the very end, he says, well, since no one else could stop you, I guess it's up to me. And he gets up, and all of a sudden, he is the fastest, strongest, meanest opponent that anybody has met to point on this. Yeah. But wow. everybody assumes his, his fat is actually just incredible muscle. And um, Hasbro balked at it. They said, no, that's that's too effeminate. They'll think he's a homosexual. And I said, well, who cares? What? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that's um, what they said about Leatherneck and uh, Wetsuit, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> uh, leather, leatherneck. I mean, I'll tell you, we always assumed that. Uh, we just went, well, yeah, okay, that's what he is. Uh, there was, there was really when we were writing the show, there was a lot that we assumed about the characters that you don't see. That we just, we just went, well, this guy is this, or that this character is that. Um, I mean, obviously, shipwreck has got a pretty salty background to it. Yeah, and, imagine. But we could only barely hint at what he gets involved in. I mean, our it it was as far as we could go to show him going to a pool hall. That was as risky as we could get with with shipwreck. Are you um, going to push the envelope a little bit more in uh, your upcoming novel, or maybe even throw in a, a reference to Mary L or one of those type of background characters you could get away with a little more now? I understand that there are some requirements. I'm not saying that, but given that the target is an, uh, an adult audience now with the books, adult fans, as opposed to the cartoon clearly aimed at a younger audience, the fact that Hasbro isn't reading it themselves and just in general, it seems like you can get away with a little more these days, uh, at least in some areas. It's a thought. Curious to see how that goes with what does get published. Somebody asked me, what would you have done if if Hasbro had told you you can do anything you want as the G.I. Joe movie instead of what they wanted, which was the whole Cobra Law thing? And I told him, if I could have done anything I wanted to do as the G.I. Joe movie, I would have done Shipwreck on Shore Leave in Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I could figure out a way of working a, a Cobra storyline into that. So I'll say this. I'm not making a promise. But if the most dangerous man in the world goes over well and if people like it, I may give some thought to shipwreck on shore leave in Tijuana. Just that you, is the you, title you, would get me to buy it instantly, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I'm going to have to say this right now. You heard it here first, people. We if you want to read Shipwreck in Tijuana, buy The Most Dangerous Man in the World. Are you aware of Venture Brothers Shore Leave? I love the Venture Brothers. I, I love that show so much. And yes, I'm aware of Shore Leave. I almost fell out of my chair laughing the first time <laughs> I appeared. And, Shore Leave uh, is awesome. It's only gotten crazier and funnier uh, with every every passing season. Uh, the thing that I love most about Venture Brothers is that for all the nuttiness that goes on in it, it is a show with um, a core moral value. And the interesting thing is the real focal character is not um, the Venture Brothers themselves. It's their father, Rusty. Mm -hmm. And every time Rusty has a hard choice between the easy wrong way and sticking it out and doing the right thing. He may regret it, but he sticks it out and he does the right thing. And to me, I'm going, yeah, go go, Team Rusty, because it, it is so easy in television today to just watch people take moral shortcuts and, mm -hmm. and you know, not do the right thing. And it's this, this show, to me, I, I want to watch it again and again because, you know, Whenever it comes time to make the right choice, people make the right choice. I hadn't I thought mean, of it like that. My wife is hmm. the one who turned me onto the show, and normally I'm looking for the, the morality, but I was just lost in laughing. Yeah. 
Hey, Brock it, Sampson, A plus yeah. love Brock says my favorite episode of Venture Bros was uh, Dr. Henry Kellinger it's just like trying no. to make Rusty turn evil. Yeah. That was yeah. That that to me was one of the things that sold it. Um and the one where he loses a kidney and and he doesn't take one from one of his uh his sons. And there there were several like that. Oh, yeah. the, absolutely the favorite is the one where the uh his twin brother, his parasitic twin brother manages to get out of his body and is craving for revenge and Rusty says, You know, you're right, I owe you half of everything and gives him Half of his stuff gives him half of the uh, the venture fortune, mm. and I thought, wow, you know, that almost never happens in in real life, and it certainly never happens in uh, in fiction. You know, usually the person is a, a selfish jerk all the way to the end. Mm. Yeah. He's more of a fact; he just doesn't want to be bothered with anybody. I really enjoy it. Well, is there anything else, uh, Buzz, that you would like to plug? Anything like that? I know you have a regular website you update. Uh, Chuck, or I said Chuck. Why did I say that? BuzzDixon.com. I'll edit that out. I actually have written down here uh, to say, should we clear up for everybody that you're not Chuck Dixon from IDW? Because that's two <laughs> Dixons. And I'm looking at my notes and I just blurted it out. But uh, yeah, no relation, correct? <laughs> No, no relation. Uh, at one point on Wikipedia, somebody had said that, that Buzz Dixon was Chuck Dixon's pen name for writing TV episodes. And no, no, no. <laughs> I know Chuck. Uh, you know, we, we um, I think at one San Diego Comic Con, we, we uh, had put attachments on our badges. Mine said, I'm not Chuck Dixon. His said, I'm not Buzz Dixon. Um, you know, um, and and now to make to further confuse things, he's writing G.I. Joe comics. So right. and, and more power to him. I just uh somebody in the future is gonna get all confused all over again. So <laughs> I, I didn't intend not to ask because I figured you'd gotten that before. Uh and it was yeah. pretty common sense, but it blurted out. It, it, it happens. It happens. So, so I mean sorry, go ahead. I was, I was gonna, gonna say, say you have buzzdixon.com, correct? Yes. Uh, anything else that, you know, uh, some addresses you would like us to include in the uh, show notes? Not right now. We will be having, as I said, uh, the the book Banished Children of Eve will be coming out very shortly on Kindle. We have other books in the um, in the hopper ready to come out. I'm going to be continuing the uh, Serenity stories. Serenity is the name of a character. Please do not confuse it with the TV series. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I got my, I, I have to say, I got my footprint down on that about a month before uh, they announced the, the TV series Firefly. So uh, uh, I came up with Serenity as a character before, you know, they came up with it as the name of a ship. Um, and just keep going to buzzdixon.com. We're going to be revamping the website in the very near future to have uh, links to stories that can be purchased and to other fun things to do. And um, you'll always find me writing uh, little short things I call fictoids, which are humorous science fiction type stories. So please tell people to go there and take a look. For our listeners who uh, don't have a Kindle, like me, I looked this up. Once I found out you were going to write The Most Dangerous Man in the World, well, I I've heard about that story uh, a couple times from What's on Joe Mind and other places. I really look forward to reading it. I don't have Kindle. I don't want to read it on my iPhone. Uh, there is a app that you can have, your Kindle app for the PC, so we'll include that link as well in the show notes because you can read it straight on your laptop. You can read it on your laptop, on your, your iPad, on uh, your phone, on your desktop. I mean, uh, if, if, if you've got really good eyes, you can read it on your, uh, your, your iPod. <laughs> right, yeah. I don't have an iPad. I, I've tried the iPod for some other stuff, and it just I can't yeah. do it. One thing that we might have to do as well for those that have Android phones and tablets, and we might see if we can track down a uh, Android version. It, it it exists on that. I used to have an Android, and I did have uh, the Kindle uh, on it. Amazon makes the Kindle app available for free to everybody because 
they recognize there's no money to be made selling the app. There's money to be made selling the books that the app right. can read. So. Ah. so basically, if you have a device capable of reading a uh, Kindle Kindle book, download it. Exactly. That will do it, yeah. Yeah, you're it's, gonna get me to get go electronic, Buzz, and that means something because uh, I have like a library behind me of books. I'm a I'm a paper guy. I want to be able to write on it too. I I read a lot, not for fun, but for uh, I read philosophy books and stuff like that. I, so going digital, big deal. <laughs> well, I I understand. I I commiserate, but I I am in a situation myself. My uh, my personal library has been thinned out again and again. I would say right now I have in uh, upstairs and downstairs, I have maybe one fiftieth of all the books that I've ever had in my life. I mean, I really had to thin it out and I've got shelves everywhere. Wow. So I've, I've been gravitating towards, uh, you know, eBooks as well, because it, it's possible to, to take a lot of things that I would want to read and just stack them up on the, um, the, the iPad and just hold on to them until I actually have a chance to get around and read them. Yeah. That has to be painful to let go of a physical book though, doesn't it? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to say something here. There are certain books that I really like the physical package. There was a publisher called Black Sparrow Press that published Charles Bukowski back in the eighties. And they had some of the, it just felt, Good to hold their books in your hand. It was the right heft, the right paper texture. It was just, it was a tactile pleasure to read their books. And I've kept all of the Black Sparrow books that I had. Um, I've got a lot of old paperbacks because, you know, there's a nostalgic appeal to me for that. But past a certain point, uh, I'm just as happy to have it available electronically so I can call it up whenever I want to look at it and then just, you know, click away from it. I think this is where we're moving to it. And I honestly think it's a good thing. I think I'm a little bit of an, an old fuddy dud sometimes with the electronics, despite being young, when it comes to books, I revert to, uh, the you know the physical copy more but i'm getting over it you know there's nothing that beats you know sitting on vacation at the beach or in the hotel somewhere you know or on the plane and pulling out a, a good book and reading it there there is that i mean that was one of the the great logic points behind um bookstores and airports and in mm -hmm. train stations and things like that you you could find a good quick read to take with you and that was the appeal of of paperbacks and pulps and things like magazines but when people started more of the collector mentality and started keeping stuff and holding on to it then um you know you you very quickly run out of space yeah. and I, I i find myself periodically i have to purge even the the few books that i have left and i say few books we're talking like you know, six bookshelves here. Um, <laughs> I, I I have to go through and say, well, if I want something new, something old has to go out. I think and with the Kindle Worlds, it demonstrates a benefit that we would never see if it was still a physical based thing because there Hasbro has really opened it up to a wider audience and to a wider array of authors uh, than ever before. And this is just a, Something that wouldn't happen normally. Not that many people would get published Joe novels in, in physical stuff. You probably could, potentially, but not a lot of the other writers who, who well, get that well, chance. It's, it's interesting where fan fiction came from because um, there used to be a phenomenon in science fiction and in, in comics called fanzines where people would print their own magazines using typically mimeograph, but they also used uh, hectograph, spirit duplicate. If they could really afford it, they could uh, get offset printing. And there were literally thousands of these things being published every year. And some of them had circulations of only a couple of dozen, and some of them had circulations of hundreds, and a few had circulations into the thousands, even tens of thousands. Uh, and people just did these because they loved it. And so a lot of these would carry their own fiction, their own stories. And when Star Trek came out in the 1960s, you had a lot of people writing Star Trek 
fiction and you had especially a lot of what was now referred to as slash fiction, which of course was the, the Kirk Spock uh, um, gay romance stories that were almost always written by women for women. Go figure. Uh, it, it was a huge market. I mean, I, re, I was in science fiction fandom at the time, and I remember how in the space of like three years, it went from the bulk of fanzines that you would see at a convention being typical general interest uh, science fiction fanzines being almost completely replaced by slash fiction fanzines. And so there was this huge... Um, subculture of people who wanted to do stories about their favorite characters, having them do things differently or have different matchups, things like this. Most of the time, these things couldn't be published uh, for, for profit, for, for pay, because obviously if you did, you're infringing on copyright and whatnot. And that's, I think, where the brilliant um, the brilliance of, of Amazon putting up Kindle Worlds. There are out there websites where people can write fan fiction, and for the most part, the companies that own the rights to the original characters kind of turn a blind eye to it. They, um, they basically say, as long as nobody's making any money off of it directly, you know, we're, we're going to pretend it doesn't exist and we're not going to do anything about it. But about 15, maybe 20 years ago, Somebody at Paramount had a, a brilliant insight regarding Star Trek. They realized all these people were making fan films. And if instead of trying to stop people from making Star Trek fan films, they just said, look, don't do anything that will damage the brand. Just, you know, don't don't do X-rated Star Trek films like they could stop anybody. Uh, don't do anything that would be harmful to the brand, but we'll say, okay, we'll let you go ahead and do it. And they even let people do it for profit. They let people make these fan films that they could then charge to sell the DVDs to and whatnot. Well, Lucas did the same thing with Star Wars. I mean, uh, I, I, if, if I remember correctly, there is like a ridiculously low fee you can pay uh, Lucasfilm to do a fan film. You know, it's like a token payment, but just saying, yeah, we, we promise not to do certain bad things and we'll now go and do our own Star Wars based movie. That worked out yeah. for them because I'm not a, a giant Star Wars fan, but everyone in the culture knows Star Wars because it spread a lot through the fans. Exactly. Yeah. And so what several of these companies that are now involved with Kindle Worlds have realized is you're not going to stop people from writing these things, but here is a way to at least set certain parameters for what is going to be done and to to monitor the the response to certain ideas and to make some money off of it because you know Hasbro is going to get a slice of every dime that comes through Amazon oh, that makes sense you know the fan fiction side of things going back a little bit you know the way I see it as well, you know, all the expanded universe novels we've seen out of various franchises over the decades, they're just official fan fiction, in, in my opinion. Well, essentially, especially with the, the recent Star Wars decision, but that's kind of off topic. Okay. But yeah. Okay. yeah. But, yeah. you know, see, you look at the expanded, universe, the expanded universe material for Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, you know, Indiana Jones. I mean, even, you know, William Shatner's own Star Trek novels, you know, that you could say, logically, that is fan fiction. I, I said to somebody a while back that most of the Sherlock Holmes stories are fan fiction. They were just fan fictions that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote. The basic idea for Holmes, I think once you get out of the first few books that he did, and I'm not, I love Holmes, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trashing the Holmes stories. But once you get out of those very first few books, it really starts reading like fan fiction in that it's, it's less about how the mystery affects Holmes and more about Holmes' relationship with Watson. And the mystery is just the way that that is expressed. Yeah. I just bought the 
uh, entire official works, and I've got it sitting behind me. I don't know when I'll get to read it, but I look forward to reading that. Because of the new Sherlock Holmes TV show, I was like, I, oh, yeah. you know, I've read some stuff here and there. I want the whole stuff. Yeah. It's interesting because when you when you start the Holmes books, and I, isn't Baskerville, Hound of the Baskerville, the very first one, or is it Sign of Four? Uh, I can't uh, you know, I, I can pull it out. Of... Whichever one it is, it starts out in classic, um, you know, uh, cobblestone street horse-drawn carriage, uh, London. And the last of the stories take place in the 1920s. And Holmes is driving cars. He's using the radio. He's on the telephone. He's flying in airplanes. But mentally, for for decades, people couldn't get that idea of Holmes in their head. Holmes was always, you know, foggy, foggy London town series too because i think it's finally broken people of that mindset and re- made them realize homes can be reinterpreted you know for a contemporary generation i was gonna say yeah. it starts with a study in scarlet and then it goes on to the sign of, sign of four okay all right that's good stuff okay and this will yeah. certainly i think uh, give some legitimacy a little bit to uh, fan fiction it doesn't necessarily mean it's uh badly written or anything like that it's just uh not from the official guys or not canon in the main canon. And certainly in my mind, I don't look at at what you're doing as any type of fan fiction. Anyways, I look at it as a continuation or an else world, uh, just kind of a lost tale kind of thing. So we'll Hmm. be sure to let everybody know as soon as it hits on Amazon. uh, And I'll be sure to buy it day one. Hmm. It's almost like the, um, was it the comic book version of the very last episode of Dungeons and Dragons on the DVD box set? There you yeah. go. In a sense, yeah. if you will. It adds a little more. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, there are people who search for closure, and the thing about modern, um, modern episodic fiction like television or continuing novels and whatnot is you very rarely have the original creator take it to a place where it ties off and it ends. Um, you have that sometimes in anime where where one creator brings the story all the way through, you know, a season or two. But far too typically, if it's successful, at some point somebody else gets their hands on it and they take it in different directions and there's never that sense of closure. And I think a lot of fan fiction is people trying to find that sense of closure sure. uh, and wrap up the story in a way that to them makes emotional sense. Yeah, like what they tried to do with um, Dragon Ball GT in regard to the whole anime thing. Exactly. Which had yeah. absolutely no involvement from Akira Toriyama whatsoever. Yeah. That was exactly yeah. what I was thinking of. Uh, mm-hmm. Opposed to the efforts that that certain companies have exerted in extending copyright to ridiculously long lengths. I, I understand the argument that uh, the original 52-year uh, maximum for copyright may have been too short. I, I am willing to see it extended, but we now have it extended where it, it goes, geez, it can run over 100 years now. And yeah. I think that's not what copyright was meant for. Copyright was meant to encourage ideas to be created and released into the world by saying for a certain period of time the creator can be the sole person to use this idea, but at a certain point you got to release it to the wild. You got to let other people take it and run with it. Uh, If we in the United States had kept our original copyright uh, limits of like 52 years maximum. Mickey Mouse would be public domain at this point. Um, Star Wars would have been public domain if it hadn't been renewed. Uh, Tarzan would be public domain. All of these characters would be public domain. And I think when the corporations try to, to, to squeeze that off to keep people at large from using their characters and their ideas and they're not really theirs they're just they've acquired the rights to them they didn't create them 
I think that ends up kind of crippling a lot of um, a lot of creativity. Sure. I think it also, uh, I mean, in, in one of the ways it creates um, cripples creativity is not just preventing the hands it doesn't get into, but also it forces some people to have to redo some things. I know sometimes uh, the Joe brand will have a character pop up, and really the reason it's there is to save that that name because yeah. it's about to expire. When really another spot or another story could have been told or something like that, uh, they want to hold on to that name just a little longer. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that's what's behind the the new Watchmen uh, stuff that came out. I didn't read it, but I know that sometimes it causes comic book characters that really their story is done, but they want to pull things back out again and and make a little money and and continue that ownership. Yeah, uh, my feeling for the most part on um, multi part stories is is I draw a distinction between one story that is told in a serial form over a period of, you know, several episodes or several novels, but nonetheless is one single coherent story. And people that are just, every time, you know, they want something, every time they need some money, they write a new, you know, a new novel or, or make another movie based on the character and whatnot. And you can see this. Um, as, as much of a fan as I am of, of Sherlock Holmes, I think, I think the juice was out of him, you know, very early in the series. And I think, I think after the first four or five stories, after Hound of the Bastardables, I think it was all downhill from there. I think they just didn't have, he, you know, there, there wasn't that original spark anymore. Uh, Tarzan is the same way. The first the first three novels and Jungle Tales of Tarzan, that's great stuff. After that, I mean, it's obvious Burroughs is just phoning it in most of the time. And you can yeah. tell almost everything Burroughs did. The first couple of books are, are uh, great in any of his series. And then you can, you can tell how fast he loses interest by, by how many books it takes to get to the, um, to the boilerplate stuff. The one exception, I'll say this, because I love this book. I can't, I'm trying to remember the title right now. It's the um, Mars novel, not with John Carter, but it's the Mars novel that's basically the ransom of Red Chief. The villain has kidnapped the princess. Uh, the hero and the princess's handmaiden fight their way across Mars to go rescue her. They get there and the villain says, oh, thank God you've shown up. Please take her, take her. She is just too much. I can't stand her anymore. And the hero goes, well, you know, I've been thinking about it. She is kind of bitchy, isn't she? I'll stick with the handmaid. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you are entitled to her. You've rescued her fair and square. Nah, you can keep her. <laughs> it was <laughs> funny. And I always thought, you know, that should be, that should have been the, the John Carter movie. That should have been what they did instead of what Disney actually did. Because everybody has ripped off John Carter of Mars. I mean, Star Wars, I mean, it all pulp space opera starts with the John Carter stuff and moves forward from it. So when they actually got around to doing the very first John Carter movie, by going to the very first story, people looked at it and went, well, we saw this before. You know, we saw this before several times. If they had gone to the one that had been the send up of that genre, they would have probably had a big hit on their head. Yeah. And people like a little levity in their, their sci-fi and things like that anyways. I mean, look at Guardians of the Galaxy and how many people are getting excited about that now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things about, about um, especially G.I. Joe, but even Transformers. You had to have something to, to, to as you say, to, to leaven the, the, um, the mix. If you're, if you're grim, you know... Everything is angst-ridden and whatnot all the way through. It just becomes depressing. You don't want to see it. It's just it's just tiresome. If you never know when something goofy is going to pop out at you, when somebody is going to say or do something completely off the wall, and and that's what we tried to do in GI Joe. And these crazy things would happen, but they happen logically. Oh yeah, he would say that. She would do that. 
yeah, this is a logical outcome from, you know, if you're going to do this, then this other thing is going to happen. You know, going to that, I have to mention one thing, like, of yours from Once Upon a Joe. The Dreadnought's weighty philosophical debate. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, we, we had to fill up a lot of episodes, and you'd get an idea, and you, you would have to argue yourself out of an idea, because it was easier just to take an off-the-wall idea and do it than it was to, to put it aside and try to come up with another idea. <laughs> uh, um, we may never know that which, which is better, breath mint or candy mint. <laughs> Aaron quotes that all the time. I have no idea yeah. why. <laughs> I quote, you know, about slaughter. He can quote that. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, I was going to say, um, Buzz, um, to if, if if I was to be blunt, I think you probably coined up one of the most famous Optimus Prime lines in the whole G1 series, which was amazing. A booby trap that actually catches boobies. <laughs> that... Uh... We we snuck a few things by every now and then. Sometimes sometimes we'd get caught. Um, let's see. I I got um, Kiwi injection in, and and they they were certain that was something uh, dirty. And I said no 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 a Kiwi injection. And and this is true. It was a U.S. military term. It meant to kick somebody in the seat of the pants because Kiwi boot polish was a brand name. So if you told the body to give them a kiwi injection, you were kicking them in the seat of the pants. Um, I tried to work the expression gerible stuffer into um, <laughs> uh, one of the Joe lines as they were referring to, to Cobra Commander. And Hasbro calls me up and says, uh, this line here, gerible stuffer, could you explain that? And I said, yeah, you know, snakes eat rodents and mice and stuff like that. And, and so they're talking about Cobra Commanders, the kind of guy that would eat a gerbil. Uh-huh, no. If I see that line <laughs> that was, in The yeah, World's Most Dangerous yeah. Man, I'll be crying. I'll have to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got Owsley Chemical Works and... Um, uh, H.S. Thompson Pharmaceuticals in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we, we snuck a couple in there that, uh, uh, you know, people just didn't realize what, what it was we were referring to. And if nobody asked, we didn't tell. <laughs> really? I, I suppose that's how with, you know, G.I. Joe's sneaking in the whole, uh, you know, military jargon. Yeah. It was interesting because we would we would have people you know who who were not familiar with the military um, say stuff that I'd look at it and says you know this means something entirely different to somebody in the army than it does to somebody on the outside. Uh, is is that where is that where mainframe's uh, idea came from at the start of a rise of Pentor rise you know him and Dial Tone are playing video games and he explains oh it's a, a trick I learned in Vietnam. The best way to keep focus is to divert your attention for just a second. Mm -hmm. And then he realizes, oh, perimeter breach. Yeah. <laughs> well, that actually that actually is something that is taught by the military, that if, if you develop what's called the thousand yard stare, you're just looking out there at something, it you you literally hypnotize yourself. You things can be happening right in front of you, and you are just not able to see it. But if you glance away every couple of moments and break that, then you see the jump. Then you see the the change in in uh, what it is that you're looking at. So yeah, that's a good yeah. example of of the kind of uh, verisimilitude I would try to bring to it. I mean, I remember watching the very first. Uh, five-part serial that they did. It was written by Ron Friedman, and Ron is a great writer, uh, but he is not a military expert. And he was having fighters swoop down and cut tanks in half with their wingtips. And I was going, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> did it ever bother you that that Duke uh, seemed to outrank Flint, and Flint's an officer, kind of along um, that lines? It did, and I I did the best I could do with it. Um, 
frankly, you know, we we had certain situations where I would I would have to rationalize to myself. Well, Duke is the the command sergeant major, and he has certain day to day authority over people in day to day situations. Like he he absolutely would have the authority to tell you know an officer no you can't park your jeep there you have to park your jeep over here that kind of a thing mm -hmm. yeah and so, well all right he he gets to make certain decisions because he has been specifically authorized to make those decisions for people you know but yeah he he pulled rank on people a lot of the times and he shouldn't have. <laughs> I know when Rise of Cobra came out, they made him a major and I appreciated the change because I, I like the, the logical structure. But uh, yeah. a lot of fans were upset. They, they wanted to make sure he was an enlisted man. If I had been asked, I would have said it should be organized the way that these special unit, special forces units are organized. There should be pretty much... Um, you ignore rank with the exception of whoever is the commander of a particular unit and whoever their executive is, their assistant is. And that's the only rank that matters, just yeah. the, the individual unit. Um, but, you know, you play the hand that's dealt you. I think a lot of like the comic writers since then, DDP and IDW, have kind of taken that idea and you know, said yeah. the rank, whatever they were, you know, if Duke was a sergeant, that's what he was before he joined G.I. Joe. And he, they just never updated his file card because he doesn't really exist anymore or something along those lines. Yeah. 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 I suppose the whole rank thing also, you know, got pulled up in um, most dangerous thing in the world. You know, and a lot of military experts have actually gone, well, one thing there would be dial tone. uh shipwreck and um lifeline get promoted to a corporal yeah no and no then, colonel colonel yeah that was it colonel you know it's like okay so lifeline's an, a, a civilian medic so rank wouldn't apply to him shipwrecks in a shipwrecks in the navy so corporal so corporal it would be the equivalent of corporal finally dial tone of course being promoted to colonel from whatever rank he was the, the point of that was to show that there are reasons for ranks, that they, they just simply aren't handed out randomly. Yeah. Um, the, the term, the most dangerous thing in the world, is a, a U.S. military, uh, U.S. Army saying, the most dangerous thing in the world is a second lieutenant in the dark with a book of matches. <laughs> well, uh, the wounded life uh, leatherneck says that he says yeah. you know the most dangerous thing in the world is a green officer in the dark with a book of matches yeah that's that's the thing because they have authority they have responsibility but they do not yet have wisdom if you know what I mean they have not yeah. yet earned that rank by experience and well, that, I... was, that was that, that uh, to, to disrupt Joe, Cobra managed to find the three guys who were the last people to be high-ranking officers and made them high-ranking officers. Like, like, uh, like he said, Lifeline has the, has the ability to be a high-ranking officer, but not, not the will. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, you know um, Dial Tone has the desire, but not the skill. Exactly. And Shipwreck has neither. Shipwreck just wants the liquor allowance. <laughs> <laughs> he's st he's still wanting his uh, navy rum ration. Yeah, we had a. I I think Steve Gerber was the one who uh, came up with this, but he 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 uncovered the key to writing to to uh, to shipwreck. He said, Sh "You write shipwreck like Popeye. You play him like Jack Nicholson." <laughs> I like <that. laughs> Certainly would be a little more interesting than what Robin Williams did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it comes off as that, of course, in Once Upon a Joe, you know, he's the one shirking duty, telling stories to the kids while everyone else is working. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I gravitated to him right away, because up until that point, all the Joes were pretty much squeaky clean. If they if they had a flaw, it was, oh, he's too dedicated or he's <laughs> he he's 
too good at what he does or he's he he won't take a break for himself and shipwreck came along and it's like you know there has got to be one loose cannon in this group there's got to be one guy who just you know he's the party animal and shipwreck yeah. it, he had that written all over him <laughs> yeah. sort, of, sort of like the um michelangelo of gi joe if you will well yeah. I mean, I mean, looking at his first appearance in a miniseries, he's in a Cobra run dive bar. Exactly. I mean, we we had so much fun with him. I, in particular, had so much fun with him. I love that character. Yeah. Uh, uh, synthoid, synthoid Conspiracy is one of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. Got Shipwreck in it. Uh, and then just, yeah, I really liked him. He didn't get a lot of attention in the in the comic or, that, or even a lot of action figures that I can recall. I don't think I ever owned an action figure of him, but he was a favorite purely based on his portrayal in the cartoon. Isn't that the synthetic conspiracy, the one where Shipwreck gets knocked out and he wakes up in the uh, town and he believes his memories have been altered? Yeah, I think my, that is it. And my favorite part was that there was a callback to uh, uh, Mara, Mara, I think, uh, the yeah. girl from before. And I, I like seeing that little bit of continuity there. And mm -hmm. it, it had kind of a creepy, it was almost uh, very sci-fi and creepy. It had an adult feel to it, as the whole series did, oh. so... Cobra brainwashed uh, shipwreck. Yeah, I gotta um, say, Buzz, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I really want to thank say you. thanks for not writing down to us or are allowing people. That that's very common for uh, kids' animation today. It seems like, uh, you know, not knowing everything. Well, now some of it gives me a laugh as an adult, but some of it also kind of challenged me to figure out what people were talking about. Yeah, um, I appreciate it as well. Uh, I just want to say one last thing. Does anyone else have any last comments, questions, um, or buzz before we pass? There's something I actually want to say. To, if I was to be honest with you, Buzz, I never got the chance to actually watch G.I. Joe when I was um, a kid, because obviously over here in the UK it wasn't really on TV or anything, but hearing you um, wax lyrical about um, how, how, how much it seems you enjoyed working on the on the property, it's kind of inspired me to try and pick pick up the um, show. Well, thank you. Um, if I was to be honest. Thank you very much. When I was uh, in science fiction fandom, when I was a, a teenager, I would read these stories about the guys at EC Comics and how they they did pretty much the same thing. They were doing comics that were ostensibly kids' material, but they were writing very sophisticated ideas and very sophisticated stories and they just had a blast doing it they had a great time doing it and i remember when i was a teenager thinking i hope someday i can be like that i can be involved in a project like that and work with a cool bunch of people and just have a great time doing it well i got to and yeah I'm very happy for that and i am i am always touched and honored and i mean that sincerely i am honored when somebody says, you know, I watched the show when I was a kid, it meant so much to me. Um, you know, I had one person say, I watched your show when I was a kid and, and uh, my, my teenage son, I made him watch it when it was in reruns. And I thought to myself, thank you for making me feel old. But I appreciate that. <laughs> well, this appreciate will, this, that it resonated with people. Well, this will make you feel a bit better, I was going to say, Buzz. When my... Little ne when my little nephew's old enough, I will definitely be showing him G stuff like G1, G.I. Joe, Visionaries, etc. Anyway. I have a 19-month-old, and he already says G.I. Joe. And uh, it's not quite Destro. It's Detro, but we know who it is. Yes. And That's he wants good. to play with my my old Joe, so, uh, yeah. It won't be long before we've got him yelling, yo, Joe. That's right. Then again, uh, I did get my nephew smile to um, Peter Cohen saying, transform and roll out. So. <laughs> Actually, I had one last question. Um, Going back to your book, are we going to have uh, Zorana and Zandor? If I could work them in. I mean, I'm, I, am, I am just, I have the outline written. Yeah. Um, I, I am preferring to go through it without trying to figure out exactly who's going to be every single place. I know what the beats are, but I'd rather get into a scene and say, you know, so-and-so would be good here or something like that than to try in my mind to say, to shoehorn somebody in. Yeah. So I, I know what the action beats are. 
I know how it flows from scene to scene to scene. And, and in a few places, I know obviously this character or that character has to be involved. Beyond that, I'm going to let it flow naturally. Buzz, you've been so gracious to just let us go even beyond the, the questions we had planned. And we had tried to trim them down too. Uh, and yet you've been gracious and let us go and, and ask some questions. We got into some good stuff. Is there anything else that maybe we didn't hit on, but is on the tip of your tongue that you want to share a funny story, something like that? All right. Uh, when we were recording the GI Joe movie, uh, we had everybody in the recording studio except for uh, Don Johnson. He recorded separately. But uh, the Sarge and Burgess Meredith were together uh, the same day doing their recording. And over lunch, the Sarge was telling us about his career as a professional wrestler. And if I remember correctly, he did not let his family know, I mean, his family being his kids, know he was a professional wrestler until his uh, little girls were about um, eight or 10 years old, maybe eight or eight or 12, something like that. But uh, he and his wife finally broke it to them. You know, look, where, where your dad goes every weekend, he goes down to an arena and takes turns getting beaten up and beating up other men. And there was a charity event that he was going to be wrestling at. And they decided, well, since it's a charity event, it's not going to be as violent or as bloody as a, as a regular event. So we'll bring the girls down. We'll let them watch Daddy at work. So his wife brings his daughters down to this charity event. And he goes in. And they're doing, they're doing the work. They're doing the whole thing up there. And, of course, you know, if you know anything about professional wrestling, you know, these guys know what they're doing. It is a tough job you can get hurt but it is not as dangerous as it looks they make it look far more dangerous than it actually is it's not to say it isn't dangerous it's just but anyway the older girl couldn't take it she started freaking out and her mother had to you know try to calm her down and get her out and and as the mother is trying to hurry her out of the arena she looks back at the younger daughter and the younger daughter is jumping up and down on her chair yelling hit him again daddy hit him again <laughs> <laughs> oh that's wonderful Hi, well, I, i'm so uh, glad uh, anything last you, you know you want to say to our listeners and your fans out there buzz um no i i thank you very much i thank all of you not just you guys for the podcast, but all of the fans that remember it so fondly after so many years. And, um, you know, if, if 20, 30 years from now, somebody comes to me and says, you know, I heard about the fun you had working on GI Joe and I thought I wanted to do something like that. And I got to, I'll be really happy. So just mm -hmm. keep plugging away. Look out for uh, buzzers books on the Amazon store soon. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely put up a link to uh, where you can buy these on, on our uh, Facebook page. I mean, not just the G.I. Joe story, but, you know, your uh, young adult uh, novels and adult novels as well. Thank you very much. Special thanks again for Buzz for his service and his excellent work as story editor and staff writer on Sambo, his many other works as well. Special thanks to Gary Gotso of Watanjo Mine, who gave us lots of coaching after another interview we recently did. Uh, thanks to Dan Klingensmith, who was in that interview. Thanks for being a guinea pig, and, and due to some technical issues, we almost lost that interview, but look forward to it soon. It has been snatched from the great digital abyss, thanks to a backup copy. You should be hearing more about his upcoming 3.75-inch Joe book soon. Want to follow us for future podcasts? The Nerdversity 101 podcast is available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio for easy listening on your mobile devices. We already have a year's worth of episodes under our belt, and most of our podcasts are evergreen. Don't be afraid to go back in time and check out uh, our bumbling technical difficulties as we begin, but hopefully they won't overshadow uh, trivia and looks at your favorite movies, cartoons, comics, and more. Nerdversity is actually more than just a podcast. You can check us out at nerdversity.com for trivia images, reviews, and and more, even opportunities to contribute yourself. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nerdversity or follow us on Twitter at nerdversity101. Do you know we have a Facebook group and forums? Head to nerdversity.com to find out more. 
thank you very much for listening and good night. Good yep. night. Well, like they say in the movies, <laughs>